Um, Furthermore, though, Palm Sunday sets the tone for the somber yet transformative journey of Holy Week, inviting God's church to reflect deeply on the sacrifice and love of Jesus. And so as believers participate in Palm Sunday services, they are called to contemplate their own response to Jesus' invitation to discipleship and to consider the ways in which they too might welcome him into their lives as Lord and Savior. Therefore, Palm Sunday serves as a pivotal moment in the liturgical calendar and the church calendar, ushering in a week of spiritual introspection, repentance, and ultimately the celebration of Christ's resurrection on Easter Sunday. So today in our service, we'll be hearing two songs at the end. So we typically end with one, don't run out after that one. One song will be a song of reflection, and it will serve as a hinge, bridging the joy and celebration of Palm Sunday to prepare our hearts for repentance and mourning contemplating Jesus's sacrifice for our sins memorialized on Good Friday. I will share more about that song after the sermon, but then together as God's people we will end with a congregational song called Man of Sorrows to remember together Jesus's sacrifice and to prepare our hearts for Holy Week. So that's a little bit of uh, what this service is doing and preparing us for. Um, But also, there's other things that are happening uh, in the life of our body um, in this season. Uh, First of all, we do have a Good Friday service, which is on Friday at 7 p.m. So we'd invite you to come out and hear about uh, some of the Old Testament prophecies concerning Jesus' sacrifice for our sins. Um, Also, the very next day on Saturday, Uh, April 30th, we have our egg hunt. That was obviously postponed due to the weather. Um, It looks like it'll be a beautiful day right now, so keep praying that the Lord would see fit to keep it a beautiful day. Um, And so that will be happening um, uh, next Saturday. So if you volunteer to help and serve, um, that will be coming up on Saturday. But there's still time then to invite maybe people who weren't able to make it last Saturday, uh, you can invite them to come out this Saturday. And then we have Easter service. Uh, Sunday morning, 10 a.m., celebrating Christ's sacrifice. So please um, sit close uh, as you make your way in. You know, please keep moving down to the front um, and park far if you're able to make room uh, for family members and and visitors who uh, might be joining us on that particular Sunday. Um, One of the privileges of being in the body together is that we get to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And uh, this service, I think, will have an element of both of those things. But one opportunity to rejoice with those who rejoice is I just wanted to make you aware of one of our longtime church members, Marge Mastro. Um, She's largely been unable to physically make it out to gather with us on Sundays, but she's been a longtime member, contributor to this body. Her son Steve is right over there. Um, She has turned 100. So happy birthday, Marge, if you're watching at home. And it's just one of the great, again, privileges of being church family together that we can celebrate milestones and and do these journeys together. Um, But with that said, please uh, turn your attention to this call to confession from uh, Philippians chapter 2. It says this, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the gift that Jesus is to us. Lord, we thank you that he entered our world with humility, being born in a manger, being born in fairly sparse circumstances, Lord, in in humility and poverty, in a sense. And Lord, we thank you for his humility, that he did not seek to exalt himself uh, over others, Lord, but He came not to be served, but to serve, and most importantly, give his life as a ransom for many. But Lord, we will admit that as we hear these verses about regarding others as more important, 
We struggle with them because we have this inborn tendency, God, where we want to exalt ourselves. We want to be seen as most important. We want to have our desires and urges catered to, Lord. Um, And we'd rather uh, have other people serving us than lay down our preferences to serve them. And so, Lord, we confess our pride, our arrogance, our lack of humility before you this week. Lord, we know that you honor a contrite spirit, and so we come before you in brokenness over our pride. But we take great comfort, Lord, in what Jesus has done for us on the cross to cleanse us of our sins. And Lord, as we look at his humility, may by the power of your spirit, you work humility into us so that we may seek the good of others over putting ourselves first. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear this assurance of pardon from Philippians chapter 3. Paul writes this, Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Let's continue in worship. You can stand with us as we continue to sing. Oh! 
turn and greet one another in the joy of that truth this morning. Good morning, good morning. You can uh, start making your way back to your seats, please. Good morning. I'm good now? No? Yeah, we good? All right, there we go. You can uh, start making your way back to your seats. Welcome, welcome. One of our uh, core identities uh, as a church is to be spiritual family together. Uh, so that's why we do take this time out uh, in the middle of our services to, to greet one another. Sundays are a way of, um, you know, living as family, uh, living out the one another commands. And what we also say is church doesn't end when the service is over. And so we'd invite you to stick around um, afterwards. Our coffee team has been making moves, um, and they've got a new setup. Um, we'd really love you to stick around. We've got some new furniture in Fellowship Hall to make it comfort, uh, comfortable for you um, because uh, oftentimes we need to encourage each other, admonish one another, strengthen each other by speaking God's truth and God's word in conversation together. Um, and so that's why uh, we'd love for you to stick around afterwards. But we will be uh, starting a, a new sermon series, a mini-series, um, with some of the uh, gospel texts around Jesus' uh, entry into Jerusalem, his crucifixion and then resurrection on Easter. So our scripture reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 21. It's printed on the inside of your bulletin, if you'd like to follow along. Matthew 21, 1 through 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied up and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And there and the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna! to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowds said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. As I mentioned before, 
uh, we rejoice with those who rejoice, and we uh, weep with those who weep. And um, one of our members, um, Alan Greenleaf, had a medical condition where he needed a bone marrow transplant, and there were complications with some of the treatments later in this week, so we have just gotten word that um, Alan, uh, he, he passed away. Um, he is with the Lord now, and so uh, we are grieving along with the, with the Greenleaf family. Um, so please pray with me um, during this time. Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you that you sit firmly on your throne that you are guiding and directing all things. But Lord, from our finite perspective, our very human frailty, frail perspective, Lord, sometimes your plan, it doesn't always make sense to us at first. And Lord, we grieve and lament the fact that we still live in a world that's broken uh, by sin, that's under a curse of sin, and death is an all-too-present reality. Uh, to us. And so, Lord, we are grieved uh, with the passing of Alan. And Lord, we, I just think of how this family, Nancy has lost a husband and many children have lost a father. And we have lost a dear brother in the Lord. So I pray that you would be the God of all comfort to the Greenleaf family, that you would meet them in their pain, that you would meet them in this time in a profound way uh, through your word and let them know uh, the love of Jesus in a way that maybe they've never experienced uh, before or in a deeper way, I think. May they uh, just draw near to you because you say in your word that you are near uh, the brokenhearted. And Lord, as a congregation, we are uh, heartbroken, and so I pray that you would bind up uh, our wounds, help us to draw near to the family, to meet practical needs, and um, just be um, a way of of bearing burdens together and fulfilling Christ's law. Lord, I do, uh, I just was struck by that line, Lord, in this song, uh, redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. And uh, that was Alan's theme of his, his life, just faithfully serving you, loving Jesus, sharing Jesus, wanting the gospel to be uh, present in his family's life and through the ministry of this church and the many other ministries that they supported. Um, and Lord, we are grieved and lament that he has passed on in this time, uh, Lord, but we also know that he is rejoicing in your presence, that he is beholding the glory of Jesus in a way that we just don't get to see the side of eternity without entering through the door of death. And so, Lord, um, we um, thank you that he had faith in your son, that he was assured of where he would be when he passed over uh, into your presence, Lord, because he banked his life on Jesus alone, and so thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus that brings us home. And Lord, we pray um, now as we hear your word about Jesus that we would see him uh, more clearly and know the depths of his great love and his sacrifice, and may we have our faith put in Jesus just like Alan had his faith in the Lord. Be with Dan today as he presents your word Bear him up on eagles' wings to speak courageously and boldly and clearly point us to our Savior. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning. We come to God's word this morning to consider... Palm Sunday and the triumphal entry of Jesus, and as I was thinking about this passage, I was thinking about disappointment. 
Disappointment is a reality in life. Uh, perhaps you've had the experience where you opened a present on your birthday and you had been hoping uh, for a particular gift and it was not what you expected. And while you tried to feign a smile, you knew in your heart this was just a crushing blow. Or maybe you stepped into a relationship and you were hoping for it to be one thing and the person turned out to be not at all what you had hoped for and it end, ended in a souring friendship or breaking up with a significant other. Disappointment comes a lot of times because we have mismatched expectations. What we hope to be true sometimes turns out not to be true. And that's certainly the case when it comes to Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is a question for us, is it a triumph or is it a tragedy? We call it the triumphal entry, but for many people who experienced it in that day, it was a significant tragedy. You see, it's hard to actually capture in time and space what was happening during that time, but if we could sort of locate ourselves in the first century world, this was a, a time and a moment of significant buzz and excitement. It was Passover time, and hundreds of thousands of people are flooding into Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. Most estimates are about almost half a million people are crowding into this tiny space and into this tiny city. All these people are coming and there's all of this excitement. And so there's excitement and there's emotion around the feast, but there's also excitement and emotion and frustration around the geopolitical situation of the time. You see, the Jews were occupied by the Romans at the time, and this was not a pleasant situation. Situation. If you could maybe just grasp in some way, imagine how you felt in 2020, right around November, okay? Remember this? How, how frustrated, angry, angsty everybody was? You remember that? Some of us have tried to put that out of our mind. And then multiply it by 10,000. That is sort of the situation at the time. And, and as this is happening, uh, Jesus is there, and people have been wondering about Jesus, his nature, his identity. What's he all about? He's been doing these miracles, doing these great things. And then he comes and begins to ride into the city on a donkey, uh, the colt, the foal of a donkey. And the crowd is going nuts. If you've ever been at a major sporting event for a playoffs or, or some sort of major rally, you have a little bit of a taste of how people begin to sort of build on each other's excitement. And, the, and the, the crowd is erupting in praise and anticipation with all of the pent-up anger and frustration and excitement. And they begin to cry a phrase, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save us or save now. Save now. And they're looking at this figure named Jesus who is on a colt walking into the city. And this was significant because in that time and space, this is what kings and governors and uh, conquering generals would do is they had accomplished a major battle. They would come into the city on a war horse and they would come in with this parade and this triumph. Um, and it was a really big deal. And people are watching what's happening and they are excited about what is going on. The whole city is stirred up. While everyone didn't necessarily know who Jesus was or what was going on, as Jesus comes into the city, everyone is asking one another, who is this? Who is this guy? Who is this person, this king-like figure? And that's the right question. And in fact, the question that the crowds are asking is the question that we all need to ask and to answer. In fact, I would argue there's no more important question that you could answer in your life than to answer about Jesus, who is this? And thankfully, that is what Matthew wants to help us understand as he records this story. And at the center of this event, of this narrative, is the central point. Matthew is telling us what this is all about, and he's telling us how we should understand the events surrounding the triumphal entry by taking us to a prophecy of a man named Zechariah that was given hundreds of years before. And central to the understanding of what this is, is right at the center of the text, G uh, Matthew is telling us telling us what Jesus is doing, and this is what Jesus is doing. He is choosing to communicate who he is and what he is like. Jesus is choosing to communicate who he is and what he is like. And he communicates two simple things. He communicates he is the king, and he communicates 
He is a humble king. So this morning, I just want to give us two truths, two points, two words. King and humble. Maybe not very, uh, not very special, but this is what Jesus is showing us. And what Matthew wants us to understand is who Jesus really is, what he is really like. The first thing that we see about Jesus in this text is that he is the king. Look at verse 4. Matthew tells us this is what's happening. He says, This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. What's interesting is that at the center of this event is a sharp contrast. You see that the people have taken up palm branches, which were symbol, cultural symbols of Jewish nationalism. This was a, a sign of, of insurrection. This is what they had done when Judas Maccabeus had come and, and, and kind of pushed out the occupying power of the time just a couple hundred years ago. And they're looking at this figure, Jesus, and they're using this cultural symbol of the palm leaf to say, help us, save us, deliver us from this human oppression of this oppressive regime and government. But Jesus doesn't choose a cultural symbol. He chooses a biblical one. And that biblical one is found in the prophet, the words of the prophet Zechariah, which says, behold, your king is coming. Jesus is very clear. You know, I think a lot of people and a lot of ink has been spilled on what happens before, where Jesus tells his disciples to go and get a donkey. And it looks like as we read it, it seems like Jesus takes a donkey out of someone, some random person's backyard, right? And they bring him out. And, and, and what, what's more than likely has happened is Jesus has arranged for this whole thing to take place. Regardless of how it's taking place, the point that Jesus is making is very clear. He is choosing this very particular symbol to identify with the very particular prophecy so that people would understand very particularly who he is that he is, in fact, the king. Jesus has chosen this moment in this time of space to show his people he is the king and he has come to deliver them. However, he's not the kind of king that the people want. And so while there's all this hoopla as Jesus is coming into the Jerusalem, many of the same people a couple days later will turn on Jesus and their cry, save, 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 turns to kill, kill, kill because Jesus is not the kind of king that they are hoping for. He disappoints their expectations. One of the best pieces of parenting advice that I was ever given is to love the kids you have, not the ones you wish you had. Some of us are still recovering uh, from mismatched expectations. Perhaps your parents wanted you to be an athlete and you just had no athletic bone in your body and you couldn't live up to their expectations and you always lived under that shadow. Or maybe it was a different expectation that was held over your head. Sometimes we look at our relationships and we wish for people in our lives to be something that they are not. And that is the case with Jesus. People had mismatched hopes and expectations, and it's still the case today. Many times we come to Jesus with our own preconceived ideas or desires of what he would be like. For some, we hope that Jesus is kind of like a, a life coach. And he would just give us some good uh, ideas about how to improve our life. Jesus is a, a good path to moral improvement. For others, uh, Jesus is nothing more than an affirming friend. You know, he only ever tells me uh, what I want to hear about my life. And, you know, it just gives a nice blessing. And Jesus makes me feel good. For other people, Jesus is kind of more like the wealthy grandfather who doesn't really ever correct the behavior of, of their grandkids, right? And just gives them stuff. And Jesus is, 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 is sort of the one by whom they get all the good things in their life. For others, Jesus is an ideal political deliverer. He's, he's a means of, of, of revolutionary ideas. He's, he's willing to speak truth to power and turn the world on its head. For others, Jesus is a healer. Jesus is the one who can heal us when we are sick or things aren't going well. And while Jesus may in fact be some of those things, the fact of the matter is, is when we come to Jesus with ideas about what he is like and impose them on his nature, we will surely be disappointed. And that's what happens here in this passage. You see, as Jesus comes into the city, everybody is wondering who is this, but their conclusion is all wrong. Or at least it's partially wrong. Did you notice what the conclusion is in verse 11 here? 
Who is this, they ask? And the crowds answer, he's a prophet, Jesus from Nazareth. And that answer is partially right, right? If we know our Bibles, Jesus was, in fact, a prophet or like a prophet, but we also know it's partially wrong or at least flawed at best. And partially wrong answers don't end up being the right answers. I learned this in my biology class my senior year. You know, my professor had this sort of obsession with actually us understanding the content and, and I didn't really appreciate that because it was my senior year. I was cruising with a 4.0 GPA, and I, I was looking great. And then I had this biology class that I had to complete to finish my degree. And, and, and on these tests, they would have true or false questions. And I would typically know whether the answer was true or whether it was false. The problem was this professor made us tell why it was true or why it was false. And so while I could get a partially right answer, I didn't actually know the right answer. And that had tragic consequences. Now, I'm not a victim, but that one class (laughs) did cost me a 4-0 GPA. Jesus won't settle for a partially right answer when it comes to his identity. Jesus is much more, according to the scriptures, than a mere prophet. He didn't come merely to speak on God's behalf, but he was, in fact, the Son of God. Jesus is very concerned about this question of of who am I. In Matthew 16, just a few pages back in your Bible, Jesus is asking his disciples this question. Who do people say that I am? And the disciples give answers that run the gamut. Some say John the Baptist. Others are saying Elijah, who's resurrected from the dead. And these would all be great names to be associated with. In fact, if that was Jesus' identity, it would put him on par with the greatest prophets that ever walked the face of the earth. But Jesus is not just a great prophet. And Jesus asks his disciples really the most important question, and it's the important question that all of us need to answer, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? See, lots of people have lots of different ideas about who Jesus might be, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answers with the answer that Jesus is looking for. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus affirms that answer. He says, Simon Peter, blessed are you because flesh and blood could not reveal this to you. This is only revealed to you by my Father in heaven. Who do you say that I am? Peter is right. Jesus is, in fact, the Christ, the King, the Messiah, the Son of God. My grandmother was convinced that I love stuffed mushrooms. And so every time we had a family gathering, they would come and bring the stuffed mushrooms. Oh, Daniel loves the stuffed mushrooms. And I'm like, Grandma, I never t- tasted a stuffed mushroom in my life. I've never, I never put a stuffed mushroom in my mouth, but they had stuffed mushrooms every gathering because my grandmother was convinced and was convincing everybody else that I, in fact, love stuffed mushrooms. Now, I have come to love stuffed mushrooms because I had to eat these things. <laughs> but I, as a child, I just wanted to speak for myself. I just wanted to represent accurately what I actually liked and I didn't have the opportunity. And I think sometimes it's like that with Jesus. And we ought to let Jesus speak for it himself, don't you think, when it comes to his identity? C.S. Lewis weighs in here in his book, Mere Christianity. He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. They say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and call him a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now, you may have heard that quote before. It's a famous quote, but I think it still resounds 
well. Jesus did not leave that option open to us. You see, we can, like my grandmother, assume certain things about Jesus, but none of us would tolerate that about ourselves. We don't like when people make assumptions about who we are or project onto us their view of what they think that we are like. And Jesus was very clear all throughout his ministry. He was not just a moral teacher. He was not just a prophet, but he was and is the Son of God. And so the question then that all of us have to answer is, will you come to Jesus as king? If this is what Jesus is clearly indicating, if this is the symbol he has chosen, if this is the thing that he is saying about who he really is, that he is, in fact, the king, the deliverer that God has sent, will we come to him as king? And asking that question forces us to deal with a a pretty significant implication. Because if Jesus is the king, that means we cannot be. If Jesus is the king, that means that we cannot be. And so we can either join him, but but we cannot expect that Jesus would join us and our life. And this confronts us with the issue of authority. You see, to to come to Christ, to become a Christian, is to be one who would come up under Jesus' lordship and leadership. Many of us are willing to accept that Jesus might be a savior, that he would help us out, but to accept Jesus as king, as lord and master, that is just too much to swallow. And that's clearly the case here in the first century. You see, Jesus is a political deliverer or sounded great, but Jesus is one who would come to deliver us from sin. That was just too much to swallow. Timothy Keller says that when it comes to Jesus, we can either crown him as Lord of all or else we'll be forced to kill him because Jesus confronts all of our attempts to be in charge of our own life. But how, what we think of our greatest problem is what determines how we're going to come to Jesus. You see, if you think your greatest problem is political oppression, then you won't need to come to Jesus for what he offers. But if your greatest problem is, in fact, what the Scripture says, that you and I are sinners who have rebelled against the holy God, and that sin separates us from that eternal God to face eternal consequence, then and only then will we come to Jesus as King and Savior. I've heard it described this way, that in, in every human heart there exists a throne, And on that throne, all of us are born with the desire to sit on that throne. We want to be in charge of our own life. We want to create our own meaning. We want to uh, kind of develop our sense of self and actualize ourselves. We want to be in charge. And then along comes Jesus and says, No, if you want to have eternal life, you must follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. And so to become a Christian is to step off the throne of your life and to let Jesus to sit on the throne in the center of your life. It's to say by faith, Jesus, I'm not going to trust myself or my my way anymore, but I'm going to follow you and come up under your lordship and leadership. Jesus is declaring himself the king, and the question that we have to ask is, is he my king, and will I submit to him? But Jesus also shows us here what kind of king he is. In identifying with this prophecy, Jesus is showing us that he is not just the king, but that he is the humble king. We can tell a lot about a person by the kind of car they drive, right? If you see a beat-up car drive into the parking lot, you know it's probably driven by a poor college student. You thought I was going to talk about my car, but I'm not. If you see somebody driving a sports car down the highway and it's 30 degrees and they have the roof open, you know they're going through a midlife crisis, (laughs) right? But the kind of car we ride says a lot about who we are, right? We use these things today to describe status symbols. And the ride that Jesus takes into Jerusalem says a lot about who he is. You see, what most victorious rulers would do, they would ride on a a noble war horse, And then here comes Jesus, not even on a donkey, but on a baby donkey. Can you imagine a grown man sitting on a donkey the size of a dog, walking into Jerusalem? It's not a very powerful ruler. It's not a significant victory parade. Jesus is a humble king. 
He doesn't care about man's means or methods or measures of success. With Jesus, there's no ego, there's no power grabbing, there's no self-importance. Jesus is a humble king, and that is a disappointment to many. Because for many people, this was the moment. Jesus, uh, Jesus missed it, right? Here we go. All of the crowds, half a million people on your side, ready to take on Rome. And nothing happens. This is the most disappointing end to a party you could ever imagine. Jesus walks into Jerusalem, and it's like, you know, it's like you're at a party. I don't know if Paul Tellsford, he's a DJ here, and he's got everybody bumping, right? The music is going, everybody's dancing, having a good time. The beats are going, everybody's excited, right? And then it's like the cord gets plugged, and the lights come on, and it's just over. It goes flat. Jesus lets the air out of the room. Everyone's excited, and then he just kind of walks away. We don't see that as explicitly in Matthew as we do in Mark, in Mark's account. But Jesus actually goes to bed for the night. He, he, he looks at the temple and he walks away. Jesus, this was your moment. You could have taken power. And Jesus doesn't just do this here. He does this all throughout his ministry. Huge crowds of people gathering to follow him. And he's like, I'm going to leave, go to another town, preach the gospel. That's why I came. John chapter 6, Jesus actually realizes after feeding 5,000 people, he's got, he's got everybody in the room. He could, he could build this thing, make a movement, establish a platform. He's gone viral, right? And Jesus says, he perce- John 6, 15 says that perceiving he, they were going to take him king by force, he withdrew to a desolate place. Jesus wants nothing to do with the glitz and glamour. He wants nothing to do with platform building, or prestige, or power. Jesus is not interested in political significance or personal importance. Jesus is interested in following his Father's will. And this has been the case from the beginning. We shouldn't be surprised by this. Jesus' birth is a lowly birth. He was born lowly and of humble estate, lying in a manger. Jesus tells us the the, the very heart of his, what, what he is all about, Matthew 11, I am gentle, humble, and lowly in heart, so come to me. His invitation is to come to him in his humility, in his entrance to Jerusalem, riding on a small donkey into the city, and in his death, dying a lowly death of a slave. Philippians 2 says that he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. And how is Jesus described? By what animal is he named? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Some animal, right? And how does the book of Revelation picture Christ's victory? How does it envision the the climax, the one who's worthy of all praise and honor and glory, the only one who can open the scroll? A lamb, bloody, looking as though he had been slain. Jesus is a humble king. And if Jesus is a humble king, the question then that we have to ask is, will we receive him in his humility? See, this is one of the reasons why for many of us it's actually hard to come to Christ or to become a Christian. Because to become a Christian, when you see Jesus as he really is, it's to lay down all sense of self-importance. If he is a, if he is a humble king and not a conquering ruler, then that means I have to come to him in weakness. It means I have to lay down my significance. You see, to become a Christian is not to attain to something. This is the difference between the gospel and religion. You see, religion tells us that we have to do better and try harder, that we have to ascend some ladder of moral performance. And that sounds appealing. I can do that. I want to do that. Now I have something to contribute. I can say to God, look at what I've done. I've been good. I have made it to you. But Christianity is not a ladder of moral performance. But it's a cross where the Son of God humbles himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, and dies a humiliating death as a slave on a cross. And he says, if anyone would come to me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus is saying the road to salvation is actually a road of humility and humiliation. It's to humble yourself and to trust in one who has put himself in your place on a cross. So will you receive him in his humility? 
You see, and I think that this is the option that's really left us in Scripture, is that Jesus has come to us as a humble king and as a humble savior. And he has offered to us life if we'll trust in him now in this age. But the scriptures also tell us that Jesus will come again as a conquering king. And this time he won't come on a humble donkey, but he will come on a war horse and he will come to bring judgment on all of those who have not trusted in him. And so we receive Jesus now in his humility or we will experience Jesus in his victory as he comes in judgment. The triumphal entry is just the first picture of what Jesus is doing. And so if this is who Jesus is, if Jesus is the king, and if he is a humble king, how then should we respond? I just want to give us two, two reflections. If Jesus is the humble king, how then should we live? Well, first of all, if Jesus is the humble king, then we should honor him as such. You know, for all of the things that the people got wrong about Jesus' identity, they got one thing right. Praise and passion. They were honoring the right man, even if for the wrong reasons. They understood that this man was the king, and they were praising him. And I think it begs the question, at least for me, if they had so much passion for the wrong vision, how much passion should we have for the right vision? Knowing who Christ really is, that he is in fact the king who's not come to bring political deliverance. He hasn't come to meet my felt needs. He has come to bring deliverance from the power of sin and rescue me from the dominion of darkness and bring me into the kingdom of marvelous light. If Jesus has done that for me, how much more should my passion be than that? And I, and I think that this is challenging because oftentimes we're like, well, I'm just not a passionate person. But I see you yelling at the soccer game. I see us yelling at the TV when our sports team is losing. I see us screaming at the U2 concert. Actually, I don't see you. But, but I know we're like that. We have passion for certain things, don't we? Passion is within us. Now, all, not all of us are as expressive as the rest of us. That is for sure. But if this is who Jesus really is, and if this is what he has really done for us, then certainly our worship should be reflective of that. If he is the high king of heaven who has come and brought us into his, into his kingdom, then that should be much joy in our worship. And I've been encouraged, uh, just for what it's worth, to see more expressiveness and joy in our worship. What a, what a good thing. We, we should. And, and if you feel like you can't, it, I'm just telling you, you can Right? The, the Bible gives us so many expressions of worship, clapping, shouting, singing, right? Right? Amen, Kachung? So, so if you felt like you can't do that here because we're not like that, I'm just giving you permission. You can do that, right? Not, that, that might make some of us uncomfortable, but, but praise is befitting for the king, right? But then we don't just honor him by, by passionate praise. We honor him by our obedience. Jesus says, if you love me, you will do what I command, and he, he asked the question that probes our heart. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Why are you calling me king and then not doing what I say? I think this is a real huge challenge to me, personally. You see, I think we often tend to view obedience as optional in the Christian life. The scripture is full of commands about what it looks like to honor God with our life. And if Jesus is the king, then his wish is our command. We want to honor him by obeying him. This is what I tell my children all the time. You obey me because you love me. And God has put mom and dad in charge of you to teach you what is right so that you can flourish. And that is how God's commands work as well. They are not something that is meant to be a straitjacket in our life. They're meant for our flourishing and our good and our ultimate joy. And one of the ways that we honor our king is by obeying his commands. So I wonder what commands you might need to obey this week. I'll say one more brief note about that. We don't obey because we don't want to. We want to do something else more. And so the only way that we're going to be motivated to honor Christ with our lives through our obedience is if we really believe that Jesus is better. If we really see him 
as he is, as the true king. And so here's my invitation to you. If you're struggling with obedience, don't just try to try harder this week. Don't just try harder. You might need more effort. But here's my invitation. It's Holy Week. Read through the Gospels. Read through the Gospels and look at Jesus. Just see him as he is. Don't, don't, don't read to accomplish something. Read to just see Jesus. And notice all of the ways he is both the divine king and the humble king. And if he is the humble king, this is the second impl- implication, then we should humble ourselves. We should humble ourselves. I remember hearing the story about a campus minister, or from a campus minister, uh, who was uh, a fresh, uh, re- recounting his experience as a freshman, and he, he was leading people to know the Lord, and he was leading on campus, and he was telling the upperclassmen, you know, I just really struggle with spiritual pride. And the upperclassmen looked at him and said, what do you have to be proud about? I needed somebody in my life to tell me that when I was a college freshman. What do you have to be proud about? The point wasn't to cut him down to size, but the point was to reflect that there's really no room for pride in the Christian life. If we understand the kind of king that Jesus is and that he is the humble king who humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, then there is nothing that we have to give credit to ourselves. Romans 12, 3 says that each of us should not think more highly of ourselves than we ought, but rather think of ourselves with sober judgment. There is no room for pride among the people of God. And I think this challenges even our view of success and significance. As Americans, we always think that bigger is better, right? We know we're being successful if we're growing larger. And as churches, they do the same thing. Bigger buildings, bigger budget, more bodies in the pews, right? That equals success. But oftentimes, it doesn't. That might be an American vision of success, but it's not a biblical vision of success. Francis Schaeffer wrote a little book called The Lord's Work and the Lord's Way. And says, this is really the vision of the Christian life. If the Lord is in it, then it ought to look and feel and seem like Jesus. And there's something sadly ironic about churches and about Christians who are self-glorifying and self-glamorizing. And it is very much unlike Jesus. I've he, Francis Schaeffer in that book describes, uh, and I don't know if this is still the case, uh, but the, one of the Pope's titles was A Servant of Servant. And he points out the, the irony of how the Pope is often carried around on the backs of men in a gold-plated uh, cart. And the point is not to criticize the servant, or the, the Pope and the title, but he, he points out that this is the tendency in all of our hearts. We will give lip service to being a servant. Jesus defines true greatness as as being a servant. And we'll say, yes, yes, yes. But we would just as soon be carried around on the backs of men. And I think that challenges all of us. If we really are following Jesus, if our lives are really being transformed by the gospel, then our lives ought to look and to feel like Jesus, which is marked by profound humility and an others-centered way of living. C.S. Lewis says that the only, if you ever interacted with a truly humble person, you wouldn't immediately think, I was talking to a humble person. You would have simply thought, wow, they were really interested in my life. Because humble people aren't thinking about themselves, but they're thinking about others first. As I think about humility and humility and leadership and Christ-like leadership, uh, I was thinking a lot about Pastor Dennis. Um, some of you know Pastor Dennis is uh, retiring. This is one of his last weeks here. Uh, some of you who are newer to the church don't even know who Pastor Dennis is. Uh, but Pastor Dennis has been serving here at LBC as a pastor for 13 or 14 years or so. Um, and coming in March, Dennis is stepping uh, off of staff, and he's going to continue to worship here and serve here. Uh, but Dennis's whole life uh, as in serving this church has been one of humility. We, t- we had a guest speaker in one time, and uh, he was just totally astounded because he didn't know that the guy who was making the sandwiches in the kitchen was actually the pastor of the church. Uh, and he was totally, and I, and I thought, where else would Dennis be? Th- there, there's no more uh, accurate description uh, of, of his model and style of leadership. 
uh, and that is because he's modeled his life after Christ, and he's worthy of honor for that. Um, and he's probably crying in the back right now. I can't, can't see him uh, there. But that is what humble leadership should look like. And honor is where honor is due. And that is why we honor Christ, ultimately, as our humble leader, the one who served. Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry. We call it a triumph because we worship the king. Because we've come to see Jesus as he is. He is the true king, and he is the humble king. But for some, it was seen as a tra- tragedy because Jesus did not live up to their expectations. Jesus did, in fact, come. And he did ascend to his throne, but he would ascend to his throne by being lifted up on a cross. And there was no lower place to be lifted up than on a cross. Jesus was the true servant of servants as he died, a death that he didn't deserve for you and me, and the death that we deserve to die. And his triumph was not through human greatness or political power, but through resurrection, where he would lead a parade of captives home, leading many sons to glory. That is who our Savior is, and that is who we look to, our source of hope, our true humble king. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you. Thank you that you have not left us to our own devices to make our way to you, but that you have made your way to us in Christ. We thank you for the gospel and that at the center of the story of scripture is a humble king, one who would lay his life down for his people so that we could be rescued, born thy people to deliver, born to set the captives free. We thank you for Christ, and Lord, would you give us eyes for him and him only? Would you help us to see him as he is? And where we are hoping Jesus to be something that he is not, would you correct that? Help us to walk in repentance and faith. Where pride lingers, Lord, would you put it to death? Would you help us to lay down our self, uh, desires for self-actualization, our desires for self-importance, Lord? And would you help us to walk in the way of Jesus? And may we be as a, as a people, the kind of people who look and feel and taste, and seem, and touch the way that Jesus did. In Christ's name, amen. This time in the service, I would like to invite up Ken Whiteman to sing Via Della Rosa, accompanied by Ann Bishop on the piano. And while they're coming forward, uh, a little background to this song, as we've heard about Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem in humility, the Via Della Rosa, literally the sorrowful way, is the route in Jerusalem traditionally recognized by the Christian church as the path our Lord traveled on the day of his crucifixion from the judgment seat of Pilate, also called the Praetorium, to the place of his crucifixion on Mount Calvary. After his judgment by Pontius Pilate, the Lord Jesus was beaten, mocked, spit upon by the Roman soldiers. He was then forced to carry his own cross through the streets of Jerusalem to Golgotha, where he was crucified. This song expounds the significance of Jesus traveling this sorrowful way on our behalf. and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. Thank you. 
Una via dolorosa in Jerusalem that day. The soldiers tried to clear the narrow streets, but the crowd pressed in to see the man condemned to die on Calvary. He was bleeding from a beating. There were stripes upon his back. And he wore a crown of thorns upon his head. And he bore with every step the scorn of those who cried out for his death. Down the Via Dolorosa for the way of suffering. Like a lamb came the Messiah, Christ the King. But he chose to walk that road out of his love for you and me. Down the Via Dolorosa all the way to Calvary. The blood that would cleanse the souls of all men made its way through the heart of Jerusalem. Down the Via Dolorosa, all the way of suffering, like a lamb came the Messiah, Christ the King. But he chose to walk that road out of his love for you and me. Down the Via Dolorosa all the way to Calvary. It was Isaiah who foretold it centuries before, said he was despised, rejected, a man of grief. But it was our griefs he bore, our sin he chose to pay up on that tree. Down the Via Dolorosa, all the way of suffering, like a lamb came the Messiah, Christ the King. But he chose to walk that road out of his love for you, for me. Down the Via Dolorosa, all the way to Calvary. Amen. Let's all stand together and, and respond in song.
of sorrows, Lamb of God, and by His own betrayed. The sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus' name. Silent as He stood accused, beaten, mocked, and scorned, bowing to the Father's will, He took salvation where your love poured out over me now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto thee of heaven God salvation where your love poured out over me now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto thee now my dead end every service with a benediction which is a blessing for the road hear this from revelation chapter 5 worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing forever and ever amen you are sent